Okay, so now we're going to take a look at the HIV um, epidemic as well as where we have progressed as a nation and as a universe as far as the HIV epidemic in the world. We have recently noted that the HIV virus has been cured in mice, and so there is a lot of up-and-coming research being done. Um, additionally, we learned about a Berlin man back in 2007 who was cured from HIV using stem cells and we discussed earlier when we talked about the immune system that stem cells is going to be the key I believe to curing a lot of autoimmune disorders and all of the viruses that are are killing and making patients lives very difficult so we're going to start with that now that being said NCLEX takes a while to get caught up with the real world so what I'm going to do with my lecture today is I'm going to focus in on the NCLEX world um, questions that you'll be um, asked as well as what you should answer as far as in the NCLEX world. So unless this changes within the next year when you're taking the NCLEX, you will answer according to this lecture, okay? Um, again, NCLEX world takes a while to catch up, so that's why this some of this is going to be a little bit archaic and a little bit behind the scenes uh, than, than where we're at currently in the world. I do want to say and reiterate that it's way too soon to say HIV has been cured. The hallmark of the HIV infection is that it targets very specific cells in a patient's immune system, specifically the CD4 cells, um, T cells. And therefore, these are the white blood cells that usually detect intruders, foreign invaders, and they corral a large immune response to get rid of the invading bacteria and viruses. So while we've had advances in that area, we are a long way from being um, in a position to say that HIV is cured. Now let's just look at HIV in general. HIV is a subfamily of lentiviruses and is called a retrovirus because it carries its genetic material in the form of RNA rather than DNA. Because of this, it allows for it to become a permanent part of our cell's genetic structure. HIV targets, again, our CD4 receptors, which are expressed on the surface of T lymphocytes, monocytes, dendritic cells, and brain uh, microganglia. HIV is the subfamily of these lenti lentiviruses. Um, and remember that it again is a retrovirus because it genetically is producing from a backwards motion which is what allows it to become part of the genetic makeup of the cells itself okay and then when we have the hiv virus continue to attack the immune system so much so that it has beaten it down and the cd4 count is now below 200 um, or they've acquired um, common um, viruses and bacterial infections and we're going to talk about more specifically in the future the patient will then be actually diagnosed as having full-blown AIDS AIDS is the acquired immune deficiency syndrome it is the final stage of the disease caused by the infection of the virus of HIV so when we take a look at HIV versus AIDS we start with the fact that HIV is the virus that causes AIDS not everyone who is infected with HIV will get AIDS. However, everyone who has AIDS is infected with the HIV virus. AIDS is a result of the progression of the HIV infection, as we mentioned before, and anyone infected with HIV, although healthy, can still transmit the virus to another person. People infected with HIV may have no symptoms at all for up to 10 years. So keep that in mind. They may be totally asymptomatic for up to 10 years and even longer. There are several modes of transmission for HIV. Remember, HIV is transmitted in body fluids that are contained within affected cells. This include blood and blood products, seminal fluid, vaginal secretions, 
from a mother to child through amniotic fluid and breast milk. And, and remember, it's not through casual contact, right? We're not going to catch HIV through casual contact. So again, it's through unprotected sexual contact, whether that's vaginal, anal, oral sex. We can also catch it through sharing needles for drugs, anabolic steroids, vitamin B12 injections, etc. Anything that we use needles for to inject um, in, into our skin. If you have um, exposure to the AIDS virus through blood and you have skin that's broken, remember our skin is our largest organ in our body that is utilized for protection, then we could be exposed at a higher risk for getting AIDS or a wound that is infected with uh, blood or bodily fluids or pus. Mothers can transmit um, the virus to children during childbirth. Um, you haven't had OB yet, but when you do, you're going to learn that it's extremely messy. The mother and the child's uh, blood get mixed with one another, along with many bodily fluids. Um, we are going to keep a lookout for this when a mother has HIV, and we're going to encourage that mother to get a C-section for this reason. Additionally, we have talked about mothers and babies in the past and said how healthy it is for the mother to breastfeed because she's giving over her antibodies with babies um, when she does this. This will be the exception to the rule. If a mother has HIV, she will under no circumstances be breastfeeding her baby because she would transmit that um, she would transmit HIV through her breast milk. So we are not, again, going to encourage mothers who have HIV to be breastfeeding. The next group that we're looking at is healthcare workers and maintenance workers. And our biggest exposure threat is through needle sticks. That's why you hear me harp in clinicals all the time about securing your needle and then worrying about your patient second because the number one exposure for healthcare workers for HIV is needle sick. So please keep your needles secure and then worry about your patient second. Your patient's not going to bleed out in the small amount of time that it helps for you to secure your needle. Before 1985, some people were infected through blood transfusions or the use of blood products. We recognized this and we improved upon this. So since May of 1985, the U.S. began screening all blood products for HIV, which helped reduce and almost eliminate the risk of getting HIV from blood transfusions. It's very, very low today. Um, so again, to recap, you can only get HIV infected blood through semen, vaginal fluids, or breast milk. So please keep this in mind. And when you're caring for your patients, IV patients, of course, we're going to offer the same compassion and sympathy that we do for all of our patients. So when we look at strategies to help promote against HIV infection, we need to be consistent and you and correctly use condoms so it's not only important that we're using condoms every time there's a sexual encounter but that we are consistently doing it accurately so that's important for us to sit down with our teenagers and our children so that we can correctly show them how to correctly um, place a condom on, right? We can't assume that they're going to learn this information in school or from other sources. So um, it is important too that females use condoms. They have female condoms out there and we need to ensure that females are aware of this and again that they're aware of how to accurately um, use them. So we need to again educate correct usage of those female condoms. Um, we need to also help educate that harm reduction occurs when patients who do inject drugs or vitamin B shots or steroids only use the needle once, right? Only use your needle once. Do not even use the needle for yourself. 
there's always a risk for infection when we have patients who are using their needle more than once. Also, it's really important that we support the needle exchange program. That is where there's no questions asked. Patients can bring in used needles and exchange them for sterile needles. Um, and that way we can promote a healthy environment. We have uh, patients who don't feel comfortable coming in for the needle exchange. What we can do is educate them that if they use bleach at 100% and soak their needles and syringes in that bleach for a minimum of 30 seconds, then that will be very beneficial in killing off the AIDS virus. So again, we, if they don't feel comfortable coming in for a needle exchange, then we're going to educate them to um, utilize pure bleach and make sure they understand they need to soak their bleach and uh, their needles and syringes in this bleach for 30 seconds minimum to help kill off the virus. And then, of course, overall, the goal is for them to avoid sharing needle and syringes with anybody else. So this is just a picture of how many AIDS patients are worldwide. You can see there's 25 to about 28 million in Sub-Saharan Africa and approximately one and a half million here in North America, um, approximately 2 million in Latin America. So just take a look at this just to, to get an understanding at how overwhelmingly um, saturated it is and why this is considered an epidemic and continues to be considered an epidemic. So when we go, when we test our patients for viral infections and immune response, we're looking at a couple things. Remember a viral load or a patient's viral load is how much virus or infection is in that body at one time, right? So if we're looking at a spectrum of blood tests, we can look and see when a virus is more potent and the higher the viral load, the more contagious your patient is at that time. So again, viral load is how much virus infection is in the body at one time. The higher the viral load, the more contagious your patient is. On the cell surfaces of HIV patients, they have what's called a P24 antigen. That is the major protein of the HIV virus. So that's something we can test to determine whether or not the patient has the HIV virus is the P24 antigen. Remember when we talked about the immune system and we talked about our antibodies, the specifically the IgG and IgM. So IgM being the immunoglobulin M is found mainly in the blood and lymph fluid and it is the first to be made by the body to fight any new type of infection that enters our body, right? Any type of um, foreign invader. Then we have the IgG, which is the most abundant type of antibody in the body, and it is to protect us against bacterial and viral infections. And then finally, when we're looking at a patient's CD4 count, or we're looking at anybody's CD4 count, we're looking at the, the T cells, right? How well our body is able to fight off infection. Our CD4 count will tell us how well our body is able to fight off bacteria, viruses, and other invading, invading germs. Our regular CD4 count, or the average, is 500. So our normal CD4 count is 500. So seroconversion, what does seroconversion mean? This is the time from our initial exposure to the infection of HIV until our body is able to produce antibodies. So this is, again, the time from the time that we are initially exposed to HIV until our antibodies are created and will show up in tests. This can take anywhere between three to eight weeks before the antibodies are detected. It's important to note that during this time, if we test <clears throat> for HIV during this test, we will have a false 
negative test. In other words, we will test fa false that we don't have HIV when in fact we do because our body is zero converting at this time. It's making copies of the virus that has entered our body. So during this time, even though we're testing as negative for HIV, we are most definitely contagious and can be passing it along to other people. So as you can see this chart here, it, it shows us the four stages of HIV and AIDS. Stage one, again, as we mentioned earlier, you can be totally asymptomatic. Stage two, you're going to you're going to present with my minor signs and symptoms. We're going to get into those later on. Stage three, you're going to have moderate um, to severe signs and symptoms. And when you get to stage four, you're going to have full blown AIDS. You're going to move from HIV to full blown AIDS. And then, of course, after that is death. Stage one, zero, one, two, three and four. Um, again, stages one, two, three are based on your CD4 count, right, which is your T lymphocyte count. What we call stage zero is early HIV infection, right? Early HIV infection is considered stage zero. And this is usually almost always inferred from the laboratory testing that is done to detect um, HIV um, infections. Stage two occurs when you have the T lymphocyte cells when they are between 200 and 499. Remember your regular CD4 T lymphocyte count should be 500 and above. So stage two is when it is 200 to 499. Stage three is when your T CD4 and T lymphocyte count drops below 200 and you are considered to have AIDS um, for surveillance purposes at this point. Again, if your CD4 count falls below 200, you move from having HIV to full-blown AIDS, and that would be considered stage three. <clears throat> the severity of illness within a person in each individual person is determined by the amount of the virus in the body right so that's your viral load remember from before so the amount of virus in your body at one time and the degree of how well your immune system is working your cd4 count so when we look at how ill an individual is we're not only looking at their viral load but we're also looking at their immune system how how high is their cd4 count which of course we know higher cd4 count means your immune system is working better or how high is the viral load remember viral load the more viral load you have on board the more infectious you are so as the cd4 count declines the immune system ability also declines Remember, because your CD4 count is how well your immune system is working in the body. Late or chronic AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, is the late stage of HIV disease. According to the CDC, a person who has an HIV infection, which now has turned into AIDS, occurs when one of, one of two things happens. Either their CD4 cell count has fallen well below 200, or I'm sorry, below 200, or they have developed serious conditions, um, AIDS defining illnesses, and there's an appendix in your student handout that has a list of them, and you do need to know them for your test. So it's not that both of things both of these have to happen it's when one or other, or the other does so your cd4 count falls below 200 so 199 and below that will make you hiv um, moving to aids newly diagnosed aids or you get on page five of your student handout those reoccurring um, aids related diagnoses now does that mean all of those diagnoses on page five you have AIDS for sure if you get those different types of infections obviously not but if you get reoccurring pneumocystis carini pneumonia 
or pneumocystis gerovecchi pneumonia or taxoplasmosis um, Kaposi sarcoma if you get these reoccurring illnesses then then that is indicative of you moving from HIV uh, to full-blown AIDS can dis disease progression be de delayed? Absolutely. That is what we're trying to do as, as medical professions, right? We want to prevent um, AIDS from and HIV from occurring in patients. And if they do get it, we want to treat it as early as possible because the earlier treatment options that are will totally be directly related to how well your patient does it, with the disease. We want to start the antiretroviral therapy um, ASAP. It includes multiple meds, and they will be on this regimen the remainder of their life. And then we want to we want to encourage positive living, eating healthy, working out, um, you know, not using illegal drugs, those kinds of things. So when we look at diagnostic testing for HIV and AIDS. The primary test for diagnosing HIV and AIDS includes the ELISA or ELISA test. The ELISA, which stands for enzyme-linked immunosuppressant assay, is used to detect the HIV infection. So we'll give a patient an ELISA test when they first come in. If they test positive, then we will follow up with an additional ELISA test. If the patient tests positive again for their second ELISA test, then we will test, then we'll give them what we call the Western blot um, test. This is the definitive diagnosis test for having HIV, the Western blot test. Uh, please refer to table 36-2 in your book. It gives you a really detailed uh, clinical signs and symptoms of HIV. Remember, patients who are in the beginning stages of having HIV can be completely asymptomatic um, during their first stage. They may display signs and symptoms of fatigue and they may get a skin rash. Later stages have a variety of symptoms um, and they're all related to the fact that our immune system is suppressed by this viral um, disease. So take a look at that uh, table again, 36-2. You do need to know the signs and symptoms per progression of the disease. We will have manifestations respiratory-wise as far as shortness of breath, dyspnea, cough, chest pain. Um, they're going to be at a much, much higher risk of getting opportunistic infections like pneumocystis pneumonia, mycobacterium avian complex, TB. Um, they're going to have loss of appetite, nausea, and or vomiting. They're going to get thrush, oral candiditis. They're going to have diarrhea. They're going to get what we call wasting syndrome. They're going to have Kaposi sarcoma, AIDS-related lymphomas. Neurologically, we're going to see a decline in their ability um, and their motor functions within their body. They're going to have visual and memory losses, and they're definitely going to have visual and spatial difficulties, so they're at a higher risk for falls. They're going to have peripheral neuropathy, HIV, encephalopathy, so that inflammation of the brain due to the HIV, HIV virus and its progression and um, its path of destruction. Um, they're going to be at a higher risk for getting fungal infections. They're going to be at a higher risk for getting, um, you know, leukocephalopathy, uh, leukoencephalopathy. So look at all the all of the opportunistic infections that they're going to be able to get. And basically, this is due to, as you know by now, the fact that they don't have an immune system on board. So every virus or every bacteria they come across is going to be at a risk for causing them life-threatening complications, right? If, if these patients live this type of life, it makes sense that you would understand that they would be depressed and apathetic during this time, right? Obviously, it, it would go hand in hand. Looking at their, at their skin, you're going to see herpes zoster, 
or seborrheic dermatitis. You're going to get genital ulcers, um, persistent vaginal candiditis, or um, persistent vaginal infections. They're going to get PID or pelvic inflammatory disease. They could have menstrual abnormalities that would range from anything from having no cycles to having complex um, severe cycles where they're, um, they have um, cycle bleeding 28 out of the 30 days. So what we're going to do to treat a patient who has full-blown AIDS is, AIDS is put them on um, a cocktail, what we call a cocktail of medications. You do need to know these medications. So antiretroviral therapy, specifically I want you to know Zytovudine. It's also been known in the past as a AZT, so azitomidine, azitothymidine. We're also going to put them on a nucleoside nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitor. This will go in there and it will block that um, transcriptase that's happening. And the one I want you to know for block two is tenofil, tenofovil, sorry. Also, we want you to know the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors or NNRTIs. Nerapurine is the one we want you to know for block two. And then finally, a protease inhibitor like retinovir is what we need you to know. So you need to know these four medications. They will be on these four combinations. They all have a different aspect of um, interrupting the replication of the virus. And so they work together to help do that. So please understand what these meds do within the body and how they achieve that. Again, treatment for HIV and AIDS would include this antiretroviral viral therapy. Obviously, our overreaching goal is to suppress the HIV replication. Um, reduce the HIV-associated mortality and morbidity. We're going to want to prolong their life and also improve the quality of their life, right? We want to give them some sem semblance of having a quality life. We want to restore and preserve their immune system so that they can fight off infections and, and end up not end up in the hospital every month for a different infection, right? We're going to maximize um, and suppress the viral load, right? Remember, the more virus that's on board, um, the less likely they are, their immune system, to be able to fight off infection. And then we want to prevent them from transmitting the disease, right? We have some patients, for example, I'll just use a famous one um, because he shared it, but um, Magic Johnson is so well managed that when he tests for HIV, he tests negative, even though he does have the virus in his body. Does that mean he can still spread the disease? Absolutely. Is he at a at um, the same level as somebody who would have a higher CD, I'm sorry, a higher viral count on board? Absolutely not. Because his viral level or load is so low that he tests negative, he would be at a much lower risk for transmitting the disease. That doesn't mean that we don't want him to still take precautions um, you know, use condoms and so forth during sexual activity so that to keep his partner safe, that we obviously do. Um, goals for our patients include, obviously, we want them to resume their usual bowel patterns. These poor patients are having 15 bowel movements a day and, and it's extremely painful. And we so we our goal is to get them for a regular bowel pattern absence of infection they again have no immune system so they get all types of infections that come across their way we want to improve their airway clearance improve their nutritional status we don't want them to feel like they're social outcasts we want them to feel like they can share what they're going through without people not wanting to be around them, right? We want them to be able to express their grief and, and their sense of loss because it's huge. They have this huge sense of loss. Um, 
educating them about their disease and how it's spread and how it's not spread because there's a lot of misnomers out there around the world about the disease process itself and we want them to be absence of complications once they get on these this you know four different medications they'll notice that they they start will start to live a healthier life right and they'll be absent of having 15 bowel movements a day instead they're down to one to two bowel movements a day it's, it's a life-changing event for these patients to start eating healthy taking their meds and start getting in a position where they feel comfortable where they can talk about it with their family and friends and and and, and uh live a relatively healthy life with this permanent um, disease. Okay, so as healthcare workers, we're always looking at what can we do to make us safe. Needle sticks are the number one cause of transmitting HIV to healthcare workers. So we are going to continue to push slowing down. I know that we're expected to do more with less time, but it's important that we learn how to slow ourselves down. Slow down, take that extra five seconds to secure your needles when you're placing an IV. It's not going to, your patient's not going to bleed out in that amount of time. And believe me, it's going to be um, going to be safer for you rather than having to worry in, in your mind. I will give you an example. I have a friend of mine who about 10 years ago um, got a needle stick from a patient who was HIV positive. And I have to tell you, she ran to the sink immediately and she washed her hands, which is what you are supposed to do anytime you get a needle stick. Immediately go to the sink and wash your hands with soap and water for a minimum of five minutes. Then you need to make a report of it. And she was told by the physicians that were on call at her hospital that the hospital would pay for her to go on the all four medications for HIV. She opted to do so. And so she was on the medications for a year and she never tested it positive, thank God. So she, she was able to not catch the virus. Um, she still gets tested annually to, to this day. Um, and I can say this year she also tested negative. So. Again, be very, very careful. Needle sticks are the number one way we get it. Use standard precautions. Use hand hygiene. Again, post-exposure, go in and wash your hands with soap and water immediately for a minimum of five minutes. And then you will be given the option of starting the antiretroviral medications within 72 hours of exposure. All Many of the physicians, I have not found one yet, that does not recommend nurses and doctors and healthcare workers who've been exposed um, to HIV via needle sticks not to take those medications at least for a month. Um, again, she opted to take them for a year, but um, some patients will opt to take them for at least a minimum of a month. Okay, so that's HIV today, and we are going to go ahead and move on to our next subject. Way to go. Great job. Tell me you didn't do it. 